Aloha. Aloha and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. My name is Andrea Nandoskar and I'm the Education Program Manager at Historic Hawaii Foundation. Um, and you are at the 35th Annual Experts at the Cathedral Lecture Series. HHF is really pleased to co-sponsor this series and it's in collaboration with the 175th anniversary of the construction of Washington Place. And so this year's lectures, if you've not been here before, will explore six residences that are significant to the life of Queen Liliuokalani. Today's presenter will speak about Mualalani. Um, just to note that all the lectures are being recorded and we're also live streaming on HHF's YouTube and Facebook pages. And they'll be available immediately afterwards where you can Watch them again if you like and share them with your friends and family and community. If you have questions during our presentation, please type them into the chat and that you can do that throughout and we'll collect them and get to as many of them as we can in the Q&A portion. And we also have a very brief survey at the end, which is really helpful. If you can complete that, we'd be very grateful. For those new to Historic Hawaii Foundation, we are a statewide nonprofit that helps people save historic places. And these are sites that tell the stories of the multi-layered history of Hawaii. We do this through education, advocacy, assistance, and protection of and for historic places. Today, I want to mahalo our, both our event partner and our speaker, which is Dr. Ralph Kam. He's the curator and coordinator of the expert series. And he's also a lecturer with the Historic Preservation Graduate Certificate Program, American Studies Department at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Dr. Kam holds an MA and a PhD in American Studies from the University of Hawaii at Manoa specializing in Asian Pacific American studies and media studies. And he holds an MA in public relations from the University of Southern California. He's the author of Death Rights and Hawaiian Royalty, Funerary Practices in the Kamehameha and Kalakaua Dynasties from 1819 to 1953. And co-author of Partners in Change, a biographical encyclopedia of American Protestant missionaries in Hawaii and their Hawaiian and Tahitian colleagues, 1820 to 1900, and that was published in 2018. He's contributed 11 articles to the Hawaiian Journal of History, including determining the birth date of Kaui Keauli, Kamehameha III with Ashley Dartsmith. Welcome, Dr. Cam. Please take it away. Thanks, Andrea. So today we're talking about Mulaulani, and uh, this, this slide uh, illustrates the, uh, the name Mulaulani, the English translation of it. So innumerable royal buds. So this uh, is a picture of the crown flower uh, that was uh, reputed to be uh, Queen Luliokalani's favorite flower. So I thought it fitting to have these buds uh, represent Mulaulani. And this, this uh, picture also uh, talks about Mulaulani itself because in all the years that I have been researching and searching for a picture of Mulaulani, uh, I have not been able to find a photograph of the residence, uh, even though it is, has a, a long history as uh, I'll share with you today. So this, uh, this residence, um, I started researching it because I had read in, um, in a, a book that Queen Lilikalani's house was located on Robello Lane. And um, the book all of you are probably familiar with, Place Names of Hawaii was the source for that. But the, um, the primary sources that I initially consulted were actually uh, from the princess herself. 
So in attempting to locate where Mulalani was, uh, the first mention is by the princess herself, who says that her residence, uh, about her residence on February 6th, 1885, took a drive with Mrs. Yu and Mrs. Wilson to my new house. So this is uh, from her diary. If it seems that the uh, diary entries are short and almost abbreviated, it's because the diaries that uh, Princess and Queen Liliuokalani wrote are very small uh, volumes. I actually uh, had a chance to look at one of the volumes and it was, uh, it was almost like two inches by uh, two and a half inches at most. So these are very small and had very small areas to write in. So the uh, entries that we have are almost in um, a shorthand uh, version of a longer uh, version. I think they were just there for uh, Lulu Kalani to remember what happened on that, that day as she was doing things like later writing uh, Hawaii Story by Hawaii's Queen. So the second, um, another reference was to on Sunday, March 15th, she wrote about the preparations for moving into this new house. So the king called and warned me about the new house. Uh, Mary, Ailao, Kai, Kaipo, uh, all separate people. Um, but, you know, there weren't commas in the diary because these were of very fast written items. I went with me to Kapalama. Matting already must move in Wednesday. March 18th is that date, 1885. Two fish to get. Maneva Neva for gate. Mananalo for Pico Hale. M. Dine must drive in side gate. And then she, uh, she writes one of these rare phrases in, uh, in Olelo, Hawaii, uh, in the diary. Most of the diaries are in English themselves. So she wrote a note. Uh, there's a note in the transcription to the diary that translates that. Enter it back of the house, up to the tabu enclosure of the house. Don't forget. So March 18th, 1885 was the second day of the lunar month of Nana. Uh, so I wrote an article on this for the Hawaiian Journal of History. I did not include this, uh, this interesting component of that. Uh, she, Davida Malo uh, has a reference to uh, the ceremony for dedicating in a house. Uh, this beautiful ceremony was generally known as Kaoki Ana o Kapiko o Kahale, the cutting of the navel string of the house. It is more easy to imagine than to describe the analogy between cutting the umbilical cord and the trimming of the thatch over the doorway of a new house. The completion of this symbolical ceremony was the signal for feasting by the whole company. Uh, this is a, a English translation by uh, Nathaniel Bright Emerson, and he uh, did the translation, and this was published uh, by the Hawaiian Gazette in 1898. Uh, the idea of uh, cutting this final peach piece of thatch uh, from a hale pili, uh, would, that would be the completion of the house or the dedication of the house. So the, um, the house was not actually uh, opened on the 18th as she had hoped. Uh, instead, on Sunday, March 29th, 1885, uh, Liliuokalani moved into her house. She recorded in her diary that day, this is the day I am supposed to take possession of this house. I think I shall call it Mulaulani. So this is the first reference that uh, she makes to uh, the name that she is giving the house. And March 29th itself was the 13th day, uh, Hua of the month Nana. 
So it would have been um, Hua was one of the three full moons of the uh, lunar month. So it would have been illuminated at night. This was a time when uh, planters would plant round things uh, in being similar to the round moon. And Mulaulani Lani may have been named in honor of Princess Ruth Ke Li Kolani, who was um, her house neighbored uh, Mulaulani. So this is a, a name that was used for Princess Ruth in an 1861 set of songs titled Hei Noa Ka Haku O Hawaii. And she's listed with uh, the, her, brother, her half brothers and half sister in that song. So there is, um, there's no other indication that I know of uh, where the explanation is made for why the house was named uh, Mulaulani. So this is um, my speculation. Since we have no pictures, uh, the best I can do is give you a oral description of Mulaulani. Uh, the residence consisted of two single story wings forming an L-shaped footprint. Uh, the wing facing King Street featured a 10-foot veranda that stretched across the 100-foot wide front face of the building. So if you can stand on, if you stood on Richard Street and looked at the Ilani Palace, that is um, the size of uh, the front face of Mulaulani. And it had a similar, uh, Will an eye on the back face. Uh, the other wing was set at a right angle to the main wing and ran perpendicular to King Street. And it too was 100 feet in length with a veranda on the southeast side, the side that would uh, face Diamond Head. And the house seems to be uh, oriented, uh, simply oriented to the street. So King Street, which was once called Palama Street, uh, is a street that the house is oriented towards. Now, I had some difficulty finding um, Mulaulani simply because there are references that modern uh, reference works uh, indicate different places for where uh, Mulaulani would have been. So the first one I found was that reference in place names of Hawaii that refers to uh, Robello. So Robello Lane is across the street actually from where the house was, but that's the first reference I got. And it said the lane was the site of Queen Liliuokalani's Palama home. So that was my first um, sort of uh, misleading reference. And the source of that reference was the source for uh, the reference. So uh, if you look at place names in Hawaii, it gives um, little abbreviations after them. And this one said uh, TM. So that was a reference to Honolulu street names. Uh, that was a column written by Clarice Taylor, who also did a wonderful column on the days of the Hawaiian lunar calendar. But this, this one was a street name and it was in collaboration with George Miranda. And the entry in that column read, the lane was a center of fashionable Palama in the 1880s and was a site of Queen Liliuokalani's uh, Palama home. So I uh, started trying to find out where on Robello Lane the home was. Uh, another confusing reference was uh, to uh, Mulaulani itself in that uh, volume. And it said, site of the Queen Liliuokalani's Lu Children's Center, Kapalama section, Honolulu. Uh, Liliuokalani had a home here. So this is a sign for the uh, Queen Liliuokalani's Children's Center. Uh, it closed in September of 2020. So uh, this sign is no longer there. So one of the misleading references uh, has, uh, has disappeared if you want to say it that way. 
Uh, this is a song that Lilio Kalani wrote uh, at, um, after she had occupied the home. Um, Kahiko Okuki no kule popo he kalai no he ai muolaulani kahe beauty la he mauia no na kau. So uh, this is the song that Lulu Kalani wrote for uh, this house and for her time there. If you want a better rendition of this song, uh, the Casamero brothers did a wonderful uh, version of this song. So this, um, this house is recorded in your diaries, it's recorded in song. And it's recorded in the newspapers of the day. So this is the first reference to a royal reception at Mulaulani. Now, royal receptions were the receptions that uh, royalty uh, have duties to have public receptions. And this one was held at Mulaulani on the 21st. And on the right, you see a picture of Henry Berger and some of the members of the Royal Hawaiian Band. So they were stationed on the grounds and uh, played selections during the reception hours. Uh, these receptions were uh, regular on a certain day of the week and repeated um, in a, a periodic manner. This is the first map that includes the house. And you can see the um, L-shaped uh, building that's on this map. So that is the shape of Mulalani. And it, again, this is a misleading reference that uh, initially threw me off. Uh, it says R. Kei Kolani, uh, which is a misspelling for uh, Kei Li Kolani. Uh, and that uh, house should say Liliwo Kolani. Uh, in this area here, on Road to the Insane Asylum, uh, Princess Ruth had her home in this area. Uh, the Dowsets lived across uh, the street from Mulaulani. So you have uh, a number of uh, very high-ranking royalty and uh, politicians living in this area. And that's why the reference to uh, fashionable uh, Palama. It is at this house that she was uh, given the invitation to come to Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee. And this is a picture of her in 1887, uh, the year that she went up to that Jubilee. In fact, this picture is a picture that is uh, taken uh, in England. It's also the year that King Kalakaua was forced under duress to sign the uh, Constitution of 1887, which stripped him of a number of powers, such as appointing uh, members of the House of Nobles. Uh, this was later nicknamed the Bayonet Constitution. And this will have a bearing on uh, activities later in her uh, related to Mulala. Uh, having this house, uh, a large house, allowed her to be hospitable. And two of the guests that uh, stayed there in October of 1887 were Robert Wilcox and his wife, Gina Sobrero. Uh, Robert Wilcox came back as and became a guest of her because 
of the Bayonet Constitution. And you had uh, programs cut back and that was one of them, the uh, education of Hawaiians abroad that had been funded by the government and included Robert Wilcox uh, in Italy. So they were forced to uh, come back to Hawaii. Eventually, uh, the daughter of Dina Sobrero and Robert Wilcox was named Mualaulani at Queen Liliuokalani's request. One of the last events that occurred at Mualaulani uh, was the birthday of Queen Liliuokalani. This was her uh, 50th birthday and the Hawaiian Gazette report uh, Princess Liliuokalani was dressed in a cream colored satin with silk trimmings and generally congratulated upon her hale and hearty appearance in turning the half century of life. And I, I think that's a very apt description. This is an actual uh, photograph from that year. And I think that uh, she does indeed have a, a hale and hearty appearance. Uh, her brother's birthday uh, followed in November, and that was uh, probably the last major event that occurred at Mulalani. And the reason why these were the final events was in April of 1889, uh, Mary Dominus died. So uh, Rihanna Williams uh, shared about the uh, the friction between uh, Mary Dominus and Queen Liliuokalani. So with the death of Mary Dominus, uh, it allowed Liliuokalani to move back into uh, Washington Place. And despite that move, the move from Mulaulani to Washington Place, her home continued to have or play a, a historic, historically significant role. So uh, Robert Wilcox was involved in a number of rebellions. Uh, this was the, uh, the first major one. So in 1899, 18, sorry, 1889, uh, Robert Wilcox, who had gone to San Francisco uh, following his stay at Mulaulani, he returns again and lives at Mulaulani. And it's there at Mulaulani that he plans this Wilcox Rebellion of 1889. Uh, the reason why they have the well, rebellion is to try to uh, overturn the Bayonet Constitution. Because he's there at Mulaulani doing this planning, uh, following the failure of this rebellion, many people questioned whether Princess Liliuokalani had knowledge of the rebellion or uh, was uh, participating in those meetings. Uh, she claimed that she was not, uh, but on July 30th, 1889, the rebels gathered under the banyan tree, which was then next to Mulaulani, and marched down King Street to Iolani Palace. A sad thing about the banyan, uh, it was standing there for over a century. Uh, re uh, within the last uh, five years, it was uh, felled because of disease. So that banyan, uh, which is between Kamakapili and Pua Lane, uh, is no longer is no longer standing. So this is a map that shows Lil Kalani's name next to the house. Again, you see that L shape. Um, again, uh, there's trouble with the map makers spelling Hawaiian names correctly. So this one's missing an A out of Lil Kalani. The rectangle here is where Princess Ruth's house was located. You can see the Dowsett 
um, compound across the street here. Uh, Palama Chapel uh, eventually moves and becomes uh, Palama Settlement in the current location of Palama Settlement. Now the constitution, uh, the Bayonet constitution was a constitution that limited the power of uh, royalty. And so there was uh, great public sentiment in uh, changing that constitution. And so in 1892, a series of meetings occurred to uh, draft a, a new constitution. And uh, these uh, meetings were held at, at Mulalani. Uh, now, when Lulu Kalani became queen following the death of her brother, uh, she swore um, allegiance to the constitution in place, which would have been the Med Bed Net Constitution. So, this would have been a legal means to change that constitution. Uh, simply having a draft and going through the process of uh, changing the constitution. So those that meeting was held at, uh, at Mulalani itself. I guess I shouldn't skip over the uh, overthrow. Uh, the monarchy was overthrown, 1893, and so uh, she is at Washington Place. Mulalani is empty. So for the for the house there, uh, Albert George Sidney Hawes, who was British Commissioner and Council General, leases Mulalani as the British Consul. And this is one of these um, strange aspects of uh, the story. Here you have a British consulate, you have a princess living in a structure, and yet I have yet to discover uh, a picture of Mulalani. Uh, one of the nice things about the British consulate being there was once again, Mulalani became a place for major social events. So whenever Queen Victoria had a birthday, uh, Hawes would hold an event at Mulalani. So that was, that was the lease that started on July 13th, 1895. Uh, this is a, uh, a map from the Dakin fire maps. And you can see uh, the most detailed of the drawings of Mulalani. So you can see the 10 foot lanai on the front here and these curved stairways. So there is a picture of Princess Ruth's uh, Keuo Hale uh, on Emma Street that has a set of these sort of curved stairs. So I, I, I wanna believe that if I ever see a picture, I'll recognize it because it has the curved stairs here and off to the side here. And then you have this wing. This is the wing that Robert Wilcox would have lived in. This is King Street down here, and Poole Lane would in the future be in this area. So Hawes uh, tragically uh, died. Uh, he was on a vessel from the neighbor islands he fell and struck his head. And because of that, uh, he uh, died. His fiance um, and him were going to have their wedding at Mulalani. And instead it became the, the place for, for um, memorial services for him. Uh, replacing him was acting commissioner, uh, W.J. Kenny. And here's another lead to pictures that I have not found any, but there might be out there. The Honolulu Cricket Club, uh, the oldest um, 
Cricket Club in the Pacific, thanked Kenny in 1898 for his hospitality in allowing the grounds of Mulaulani to be used for cricket. Uh, Robert Hoare uh, followed uh, Kenny as his Britannic Majesty's Council at Honolulu. So Victoria has died and therefore he is now his Britannic Majesty. And the address for the British Consulate is given as 651 King Street. So we finally have an address for it, not on Orbella Lane, uh, King Street. And in 1901, you had uh, the transfer uh, of the lease from uh, Robert Hoare to uh, Nakata. And Nakata in turn subleased it to K. Koyasu in July 30th, 1901. Uh, the old British consulate opposite the Dowsett homestead on the Palama Road is now being used as a Japanese hotel. So, you know, there may be a picture that the Koyasu descendants have of the hotel, which would have been a picture of Mulaulani. Uh, during this uh, interim, after the after the Japanese uh, hotel was in it, there were also political gatherings on the grounds. Uh, fittingly, uh, Robert Wilcox, who had once lived in uh, Mulaulani, uh, had meetings of his home rule party uh, in that area, and other parties uh, also had gatherings on those grounds. So there remained a political sort of vet uh, of Mulaulani. So uh, when Lulu Kalani was needed money to wage her uh, attempt to get reimbursement from the US federal government uh, for um, the takings of the lands here, she took out a $70,000 mortgage from Klaus Spreckels and Mulaulani was one of the properties that was included in that. At one point, the supervisors of the city and county of Honolulu proposed that Mulaulani become a park uh, and be known as a, a Liliokalani uh, park. Uh, today you have Liliokalani gardens but they are another set of Lulio Kalani's properties that are above School Street. Uh, unfortunately, this um, never came uh, into existence. And so you, um, you start seeing uh, the division of Mulaulani itself uh, into what are called tenements. Now tenements have a uh, pejorative uh, connotation today. But at that time, a tenement simply meant a building that had a number of tenants in it. So uh, each of these, you'll notice a number of apartments that uh, Mulaulani has been divided up into. And there are buildings on the King Street side, including um, moving pictures, a bicycle repair, and a hand laundry. So this is in 1914. So no longer hotel, now tenements. Uh, same in 1927. Now you have uh, baths, a uh, cycle and a restaurant in the building immediately in front of Mulaulani. And notice that the main house here in 1927 has been replaced by six structures. Uh, this is because the Liliokalani Trust, uh, their goal was to make income for the trust. And so the house uh, was turned into six uh, different apartments. And this is really the only picture I have of Mulaulani. Here you have that L-shaped a wing, the wing that goes perpendicular to King Street. 
along with the six similar structures. And here it is in a map. 1952, it was replaced by the Merite homes. So Merite homes are named for George Frederick Wright. And he was mayor from 1931 to 38. He died in the office and they were building um, public housing projects, uh, Kamehameha homes across from Farrington. And this was planned for that time. And so received his name. And this is the Mayor Wright homes as they were dedicated uh, by Governor Sir Rao, who was acting governor, dedicated January 16th, 1953. And he talks about in his speech, uh, his commitment to a slum clearance. Uh, so you see in this area, the three buildings still standing. And this building <coughs> would have replaced that L-shaped wing. Now these homes in 1952 were show places for what government could do to alleviate uh, slums and the conditions in slums. So in uh, 1956, you still see these structures and this is building two. And this is building two today. They're right housing or Merite homes, but there are plans for these grounds. So you notice there is a community park. If they were to put it here, it would be in the location of the original plan by the city or the request of the city for a uh, park on the Kalani premises. Uh, the new plans call for uh, towers between 260 and 380 feet tall and replacing the six, 364 units with 2,448 affordable and market rate units. So these are some drawings of uh, the plans uh, for that site. So you can see how this um, Merite homes would change uh, in the vision of the project that is uh, contemplated. Uh, they have recently changed the, um, the developer, so uh, these plans may uh, well change also. So that, uh, that is Mulau Lani, and I'm, I'm open to any questions that people might have. Thank you, Ralph. It's, it's fascinating. We do have some. We do have some questions. One was uh, initially just from Phil asking for clarification. I think um, Princess Ruth had died one to two years before Luol Dalani was dedicated. He was just wanting to confirm that. Excellent. Um, Diane is asking who owns the land there now. Uh, the the land that's on the. A strip on King Street. It's divided into two, two parts, really. So there is um, King Street footage. And I don't really know who owns that. Uh, there's a, a shell station and a uh, business that does tile and uh, granite work on uh, some strips in the front. Uh, in the the back portion of it is owned by the uh, Hawaii Community, uh, Hawaii Housing Authority, uh, which owns all of the uh, Mayor Wright Homes land. Um, moving to, while we wait, um, and I encourage people who are, who are with us, and there's a lot of you, to think about any, any questions while we have Dr. Cam here ready to answer. You can just put them into the chat. Um, Dr. Kim, can you answer a few questions? Um, 
struck by the size of the, the diaries and also the idea of keeping diaries and wondered if you can just speak a little to whether that was a common practice back then and why they might be would, would have been so small and also was it common for the monarchy to keep diaries? Okay, so of, of the monarchs, uh, King Kalakaua uh, kept a diary when he was on his around the world trip, uh, but it's not, um, there are large gaps in it, so it is in no way as comprehensive as Lulu Kalani kept. She kept an almost um, a daily diary. And one of the nice things uh, that uh, occurred was David Forbes did a, uh, a book on her diaries that uh, has not only the diary entries, but also um, a annotation as to uh, what various um, names of people, places that are in the diary. Uh, sadly, uh, David just recently passed away. So uh, we, we, I think Hawaii had uh, lost a, a great historian um, and he was writing uh, books until, uh, until he died. So um, Kaiulani, uh, to my knowledge, did not uh, keep a diary, but she, uh, has written a series of letters. So in a way, uh, you can trace the chronology of day by day by the letters that she has to various people. So that's, um, that's a, uh, a substitute for diaries. But I have not uh, found um, any other major diaries of any of the royalty. So Lilio Kalani really uh, has taken those um, diaries and used them to the fullest extent. Now, uh, there were other Victorian visitors who kept diaries. Uh, so I think it may be um, a practice that was very popular in the Victorian era. Now the diaries are small, I think, because she wanted to have immediate access to them. So we all carry our iPhones or our Androids and are able, if we have to uh, write a note, we have it at hand and it's small. So I think that's the reason why she used uh, small, small diaries because she was just jotting uh, notes uh, so that she could later, for instance, be able to uh, recount what was happening on what day uh, for her book, Hawaii Story by Hawaii's Queen. So it's, um, I, I think that they were a, uh, a resource for her for that sort of purpose. Now, because of the political, uh, political problems uh, in the overthrow, uh, one set of her diaries is now in Bishop Museum archives and the other is in the Hawaii State archives because uh, 1895 when they, uh, we're looking to see if the queen participated in the counter-revolution. Uh, they took her safe and her safe had a set of diaries in it. And those became the property of, of the Republic of Hawaii and later the territory and down to today. Um, we had a question about whether they're available for public viewing or are they just the diaries at Bishop and do you know? Ah, all of the diaries have been transcribed. So uh, I think that it would be a, it would be a rare instance on why you would need to actually uh, see the diaries themselves because uh, what, what archives are trying to do is keep handling at the minimum. And that's one of the reasons why they, uh, they transcribed them. So when I was doing the article um, in the Hawaiian Journal of History, I actually had a question that would, would have required me to actually see the page because there was a question on uh, wording. And I didn't know whether it was an error in the transcript or whether it was an error um, 
or whether that was a misspelling that was in the diary itself. Uh, I got an email back with a copy of the transcript. So um, I'm certain that it's possible, but it's, uh, it'd be a rare occurrence for you to actually uh, see the diaries themselves. I'm sure they show you a copy of the diary, you know, from the cover, so you could see the gauge, the size of it, but uh, I don't think that they allow the handling of the diary themselves. That makes total sense. Well, um, someone else asked if the entries, if the Queen's entries in the diary were in Olelo, Hawaii. Uh, very, very, very little that I've seen. But the best source for that is uh, David Forbes' book. And that's, um, let me see if I can put up a, a picture of that. Yeah, if you have the title, then we can, we can put it into the chat. Oh, yeah, I think you. So this is the, the book that David Forbes wrote, The Diaries of Queen Lulu Kalani of Hawaii is the title. And Diane, just put into the chat, it's available at UH Press. Thank you, Diane. Okay. Um, did Mu'o Nalani have gardens like at Palo Kalani? Yes, uh, there were gardens. I don't, I do not see any reference to necessarily the plants, but there is a reference that I've seen to, to the garden. And Lulu Kalani, I think anywhere she went, uh, planted uh, gardens because uh, the songs of their houses, uh, you know, make reference to gardens and uh, the Kapalama area that that house is built in was um, former wetlands. Uh, her neighbor's house, uh, Princess Ruth, uh, had uh, her house in the middle of uh, a large um, taro loi. So a uh, lot of water. Uh, I've seen references to the flooding of that area. I don't know exactly where in Kapalama they uh, they had the uh, Loi, but um, you have uh, tales of Kamehameha I working the Taro Loi in Kapalama. So it's an incredibly rich area. So I, I know that there were gardens uh, on the property. What happened to the furnishings? Is it possible to identify any today? Was one of our questions. That's an excellent question. Uh, there is an inventory uh, when uh, the property is um, is given up to a new tenant. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are actually listings of the paintings that uh, were on the walls in Mulalani. Uh, I think that they were in the structure. Uh, I don't think the I don't have any record of them being sold. So I don't know uh, what the disposition of them uh, was. Uh, for Iolani Palace, uh, you know, there were auctions and it was clear that they were being sold. Uh, in the case of Mula Alani, I'm not, uh, I'm, I've not read where those, those furnishings were uh, sold. They certainly could have been um, repossessed by Queen Lily Kalani herself. So we may have some of the furnishings in um, some of the other locations that are affiliated with Lilio Kalani. Dr. Kemp, do you know what the English translation of Palama is? Uh, the Lama Wood Enclosure. So Pa is um, enclosure. Uh, Lama is Lama Wood. Uh, Lama Wood is a heavy, heavy wood, uh, similar to ebony. And uh, supposedly this is where, how can I put this? Uh, young chiefs and, I don't, uh, <laughs> it's where they often would um, have relations with other, other chiefs. 
is my understanding of what the enclosure was for. Was Lilio's husband, John Owen Dominus, with her at Moalani, or was that during the time of their separation? I, I think that uh, Dominus lived exclusively at Washington Place. I have no record of him being at Moalani. And really, this was um, her opportunity to be on her own in a new location. She certainly was happy uh, at Moalani, from all indications that I have. How much time do we think she spent there? Uh, she wouldn't have spent that long because uh, 1885 to 1889 when Mary Dominus dies. So it's a four year period at most. She certainly would, um, would visit the location, but I don't think she was living there on a permanent basis uh, after Mary Dominus died. Um. I don't know if you'll know the answer to this, but are there any plans for any type of recognition of where the site stood? Like interpretive signage or just acknowledgement? But I realize it's hard to even figure out where it was, right? <laughs> oh, no, I think we could. Oh, now you did. Figure it out exactly now. Yeah, right. Um, if I were to envision a, uh, a suitable uh, recognition for it, we have the exact boundaries of the house itself. I could see a plaza that was constructed in the form of that L-shaped building um, in the middle of a park. Uh, so people could get a true sense of how large it was uh, and where the, the physical location for that was. Uh, but that all depends on the, all depends on the knowledge of the people who are putting together the architectural plans. I know that architects love to integrate these sorts of historical features uh, if they can in the, in the plans. We had a request from Mary Beth to ask is possible to see the slide with the planned redevelopment again. And I'm just want to see if she had a question related to that or she just wanted to take a look at it. Okay. So again, these plans are of the company that I believe is no longer active in um, providing the, uh, providing the new development. Okay, she wanted to see the numbers of units currently and what is planned. And I cannot personally speak about it, but I can double check with, um, with our director to see if we have any information we can share about this because I believe we were um, consulted. Yeah, I think we were part of the consultation and I think it's ongoing, but I, I don't wanna say more than that because I, I don't have the information, mm -hmm. but I can double check with our director, Kirsten Faulkner. So this is a, a $1.3 billion uh, redevelopment plan. Uh, 364 units in the current um, the current Mayor Wright homes because they're only two to three story buildings uh, so they can't have that many but this would be for 35 two to three story buildings with 2,448 affordable units affordable and market rate units. So that's a sizable um, increase. Thank you, Dr. Ken. It certainly is. Um, what or why was the, what was the urgency to have the queen move into Mua Valmani, which someone wanted to know and where was her residence prior to the letter mentioning her move? Right, so um... I think that the urgency was on her part and it was more an urgency um, of joy. Uh, she wanted to be uh, in her own place and that, that's where that would have been. Uh, certainly before uh, she went there, uh, she had uh, homes in Waikiki, which we'll be covering uh, next week. And she also um, had, I believe a house on the grounds of Washington Place. So there, there were places that she, uh, she had residences and 
certainly, uh, but this one was hers alone. It was new. Um, I just sense uh, in her diary when she uh, talks about going to it that she just has a sense of joy about uh, the home being available. Did you write other songs there that you know of? And you might have mentioned this. I'm trying to keep track. Yeah, I, I, I don't. I don't know of. Um, you know, I don't know the timing of songs and when they were written. Uh, this one um, only because uh, it's very clear uh, in the record where, when, when it was written. I, I hope uh, I hope Don sings the Paul Kalani song. <laughs> I was going to thank you for singing. I thought that was so great. <laughs> I thank that you was, all in the audience for, for forbearance on my singing. Your singing was great, Dr. Kim. Yeah. Yes. Wow. So, and, and you mentioned right in the beginning, didn't you, about the, the naming of this, this house after the plant and how that was that her, did you mention that it was her favorite? Was it her favorite plant? Uh, the crown flower I mentioned was her favorite. Yeah. I don't know that those are the, uh, the buds right. that are mentioned, but I thought it was fitting that uh, we have that as an opening screen. Okay, um, let's see if there's any last question or two and then we will wrap up. Um, let's see. Yeah, you, you definitely have a fan club. People love yeah, your singing. Um, actually, Jane, Jane um, put a question in there, I think. Uh, not oh, sure, okay. but I think I heard you say Kalakau warned her about it. I think he's warning her to... Uh, do the protocol correctly to have the fish enter in the right direction. He's making warnings um, to simply um, do the dedication in the correct manner. I don't think he's warning her about any dangers in the house itself. Thank you. And who originally constructed Mualalani? Do we know? I used to know this. <laughs> um, I thought it was Lucas, but I'm not, um, I'm not absolutely sure anymore, <laughs> but uh, because it's been a while since I uh, wrote the article itself. Oh, somebody's asking, I think we'll make that the second to last. And then I just have one last question. How old was she when she moved in? Do we know? So she's, um, she's 50 at her 50th birthday party, uh, which oh, was in... <laughs> <laughs> Matt, not my song suit. Uh, she must have been in her late 40s. That makes sense to me. And then the last thing, um, let me just see if there's anyone else from the audience and then I'll wrap up. Um, the, the ceremony that you mentioned when she moved in, um, can, you, can you explain, was that a ceremony, the Native Hawaiian ceremony of, of the cutting that reflected the cutting of the umbilical cord, but similar for moving into a new, can you say a little more about that? Right, it's, uh, it's probably a practice that was, grew up under the uh, Kapu system. And I, I think we all have uh, dedication ceremonies. For instance, today we have the cutting of the Miley Lay uh, at the opening of many, um, many buildings. So, I think it would have been um, it would have been a common experience in ancient Hawaii to have uh, a ceremony to dedicate a house, and I think having that little tuft of halipili remaining to have it um, symbolically uh, cut uh, is a a nice um, a nice ceremony in terms of entering your new house. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim. It's really wonderful to hear each of these lectures and kind of piece together this larger picture of the queen and her, her life and her legacy and where she lived. So I hope everyone is, is enjoying it. Um, I just want to really mahalo you for both curating and presenting today and for singing. And I'd also like to thank my colleague, Bethy Wata, who's been providing technical support. And I want to invite everyone to join us next week. We're on March 3rd, 
same time, noon, it will be our fifth lecture in the series, and we'll explore the Waikiki residences, Pawakalani, Hamohamo, and Kealohalani. And Ralph, there, Dr. Cam, those are locations or names of her, her homes, and we'll find out more, of course. I think uh, they're both sometimes locations. Uh, Keolohilani definitely was the name of the house. And Paukalani was the name of the house. Uh, Hamohamo may have been a name of the area, but uh, I, I picked other experts for, <laughs> for these <laughs> Thank um, you. other lectures for, uh, because they are the most knowledgeable. Thank you, Dr. Cam. And next week, um, architectural historian Don Hibbert will share more and answer those questions as well as many others. If you haven't yet and you're interested, we encourage you to sign up for the HHF e-newsletter at historichawaii.org. It's a wonderful newsletter. My colleague who's on the call, Bethy Wata, is the curator and she's doing a great job and very informative. And also, if you would like to support the work that we're doing, if you care about saving places, please donate or become a member. You can visit historichawaii.org, the join us section to learn more. Just aloha to everyone, ahui ho, and we hope to see you next week. Please stay well and keep caring about places. Aloha. Thank you, Dr. Cam. Thank Bye. you, Beth.